All right, so what I'm doing right now is I'm consolidating my YouTube videos. I started the year and my one of my goals for the year was to complete a 41 day water fast. And why do I choose 41 days? And it's minimum 41 day water fast. Why do I choose 41 days? Well, because people that I respect, such as Moses and Jesus did 40 day and night water fast. Now, if you consider 40 day and night, um, you know, if you say 40 days, 40 nights, then it's going to be 41 days, basically. You have to go at least a minute into the next day. So I have a minimum 41 day water fast. That's my goal. I am entering into day five soon. And I had some experiences. Now, when you're going to do a water fast, you need to prepare for the water fast. And you should consult with a doctor or an experienced professional before you do so. I tried to do so. And what I found is that most people are afraid of fasting. Modern theory thinking is that you need to continuously eat and drink water or else you'll die. They say you need to have water um, at least once every three days. And that may be true. That's probably true. I haven't stopped taking water. As I said, Moses did it without food or water. And I have done in the past, um, a few years ago, I did 10 days, no food, no water. So. I don't know if you actually need to have water every three days, but right now I do know that I have certain condition that requires me to drink water. How do I know that? Well, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. The brain tumor was a mass. They found a lesion in my brain, and then I had to do some research and investigate. And through a eight and a half years, Okay, eight and a half years. First, I basically thought to myself, well, they found something using a CT scan and an MRI in my brain, a lesion. And I thought to myself, well, then I need to heal it. And the option that they were trying to push me into because I had good insurance was to get a surgery. So I had a consultation with the neurosurgeon. I asked the neurosurgeon, what's the risks? What are the things that could go wrong? And he was honest and upfront, he said, you might lose your mobility. And that's what he said. You might be, lose your mobility, be paralyzed for a little while, but you'll be able to walk again eventually because the brain is miraculous and it will regenerate. Okay, that's what the neurosurgeon told me. And so I was like, well, that seems pretty extreme for me to jump into having someone who cannot explain to me what it is in my head and how it got there, does not know the cause. And they'll say this, right? They don't know the cause. They say, we don't know what causes tumors. And the best that we can do is surgically remove and then give you chemotherapy. And that's what he was telling me. He's like, we don't know what causes it. And what we recommend is to be aggressive because it could grow. And it was a sales pitch basically to try to get me to give the authorization to take the surgery. And then I thought about it and I said, I am not going to rush into this. If it's true that I've had this and it's been growing for so long, then it's not a decision I need to make right now. I need to do my research and understand what is going on and what my options are. Okay, so that happened and then I went and did my research. And my wife, who was a lovely woman, she did her research as well. And there's a guy, Chris Beats Cancer, and a book, God's Ultimate Path to Health. And that's what we started with. And the idea was, well, go on a raw vegan diet and eat salads and giant salad and a lot of juice and we bought the juicer we got a reverse osmosis water filter and that was the plan right so got all set up and it was a good experience i enjoyed learning about all these foods that i had not eaten um eating the salad and and then i also would go for a walk or um, do some sort of exercise every day but it was not healing me and it wasn't sustainable because I was, um, especially in the winter time, right? You want to talk about have, having fun, go on a, on an old fruit diet in the winter time, right? With no fat in your body and, and watch what happens, right? I mean, you'll be cold basically, my bones are cold. And so then I'm questioning it, right? And thinking, okay, is it, and is this really the right approach? And I didn't know the Bible at the time. And so, you know, the, the God's ultimate path to health, the entire book is based on the original eating law. And, and I think it's in Genesis 1 that I have given you all of these herb yielding 
um, seeds and these fruit yielding trees, these should be for you to for food. So basically eat herbs and fruits and that's what you need. And there are people who follow that. It's called the 80-10-10 diet where you get 80% of your calories from carbohydrates and 10% or less from protein and fat. And what the person that recommends that diet recommends is that you eat a lot of fruits and you should not combine them. Mono meals are better. And then you should eat romaine lettuce because romaine lettuce is rich in nutrients. And then fat, you don't really need to worry about it. If you, if you need some fat, you can have 10% of your calories in fat. And this person has videos where he's doing these great um, exercises and whatnot. And he lives in a tropical place, I imagine. Okay, so I ended up there and, um, and I did have a ton of energy, I'll tell you, I had a lot of energy. And it was, uh, it was an experience, yet it was, a, it was intense because I would have to go out and buy all this fruit and this lettuce and it just wasn't, wasn't sustainable in the long term for me. And I would find out later that that was because, might be because I am a blood type O positive with a fast metabolism and I thrive on protein. That I can, I can digest protein very quickly. And then I found some videos recently and where the, the, a doctor who specializes in, in um, there are a couple words for it. Uh, when you have a bag connected to your intestine and it's, it's kind of like a colonoscopy, but there's another word for it, basically. You have an, you're having an issue digesting food, they will connect a bag to your intestine, so instead of defecating, everything that you're digesting is going into this bag. And what he said is basically what shows up in the bag is never protein, because the protein, you eat it, it goes and your stomach digests it completely, completely, because your stomach is acidic. What shows up in these bags, oatmeal, corn, broccoli, cauliflower, and uh, beans. These are things that are not digestible by the human stomach because it's not meant for us to eat them, essentially. So these things have, um, these different vegetables have different types of toxins on them. There's the pesticides, if there's pesticides. If it's not, uh, if it's organic, then it's better. You don't have the pesticides, but even if it's organic, they have protective measures around them because they don't want to be eaten. And so it is toxic for your body to be eating these, these, uh, these food items. If you're a cow, then you don't have the same stomach as a human being does. A cow has a three-stage digestive process called a, a ruminant, which allows the cow to eat grass, right? And so the cow can eat grass and the cow can thrive on grass. Human being is not meant to eat grass, okay? And so these days, a lot of, of um, people are realizing that. And what I ended up coming back to now recently, honestly, because I started reading the Bible, is the Leviticus eating law, which is what God tells the, the, the Israelites to eat. And that is not, it's not what is in Genesis. Because in Genesis, that first chapter, that is in the Garden of Eden. That is before the fall. There's chapter one and two, which explain the creation. Then chapter three, the snake tricks Eve into eating from the tree that she was commanded not to eat from. And then after that, everything changed. The man was no longer living in a luxurious garden. He was kicked out of the garden. There was a cherubim with a flaming sword put there. And God gives the curse and says to the man that you will toil, you will sweat and work, and then you will return to the dust from which you came. That's where we are, okay? So that Ultimate Path to Health book, not right now, okay? I, I haven't gotten myself back into the Garden of Eden, okay? If any of you do, congratulations. That, that was amazing how you do it, and I'm sure you can do it. And in there, maybe I will eat bananas and swing from the trees or whatnot. But here, where we are right now, it's the Leviticus eating laws that you should follow. What are the Leviticus eating laws? Well, you should eat certain types of meat, which is cattle and sheep, 
And when you eat those meats, you don't eat the fat. Okay, you don't drink the blood, you don't eat the fat. Get your protein from there. Unleavened bread is recommended. They, there's a festival where they eat unleavened bread for seven days to begin the new year. And unleavened bread is delicious. It's, uh, some, it's a staple in my culture, Punjabi culture. They have roti and uh, also other things like a paratha where you, you can stuff like bison inside of the unleavened bread. Those are delicious. And then other cultures, they Persia, they have lavash, again, unleavened bread. Okay, and then Israel itself has, they use olive oil and to make their uh, their wafers and and whatnot. So unleavened bread is good for you. Meat is good for you. Fish, if it has fins. Okay, and this is again the Leviticus eating law. So the Leviticus eating law says don't eat pork, and there is a reason for that, and that is because the pork causes one of the reasons the pork causes your body to retain water and that complicates healing so i wouldn't recommend you eat pork that's not going to happen if you eat lamb or beef preferably grass-fed well-maintained well taken care of and don't eat the fat eat primarily the lean cuts and as as much as you need to to build your muscle because you need protein to heal and this is something that is critical to understand when your body is healing, there's two phases to any disease. And if I had, I have, it's over there somewhere, but I have the scientific chart of German New Medicine that explains this. I'll post links so you can take a look at it. There is what's known as a conflict active phase, and then there's the resolution. So when it's conflict active, something is bothering you and your body is off balance, then you come to a, a, a resolution, you now enter the healing phase. And depending on whether it's a tumor or an ulcer, when you enter the healing phase, you will most likely need protein because what, ha what happens is whatever was growing in the conflict active phase needs to be metabolized and it gets expelled and defecated out. And you need to bring in protein to rebuild okay? that organ that was, that was experienced in conflict needs to be rebuilt and the body is built on protein. So if everything is fine and you don't have any conflicts and nothing is resolved and you don't need to eat protein, you can, you can go by on just herbs and whatnot. But if you are healing and you hit that conflict, you need to eat protein. And you should know when this happens, right? At least I, I know when it happens. I could tell, hey, you know what? Right? I use my scientific chart of German New Medicine, which I can, I can get and show you one second. Okay, so this is a scientific chart of Germanic New Medicine. It's an English translation, which is what's available from Ilsador Laker, but the last time I checked, it's out of stock. Okay, so you might have difficulty finding it. It depends on whether they're able to get more published. But what I wanted to show you is the two phases of each disease, which is described. This is a, this is a book was written by uh, a medical doctor who was an oncologist who had many years of experience with um, healing cancer. And so there's two phases. If you see here, there's a, this is what's called the conflict active phase. And then there's a resolution. And then now you enter the healing phase. And here's an epicrisis where you'll have a seizure. And then you go into the scarification phase and then you're back to normal. Okay. So this, this, there's like a seizure here and this is conflict active. Something's bothering you come to a resolution. Now you're tired. You need to sleep and eat and you need to get protein because here something gets pushed out. And then you need protein to, to build. So if you are over here or here where there is no conflict, then perhaps you don't need that much protein. But if you go and you hit that phase, then you need to eat protein. And so um, what it comes down to is understanding where you are in the healing phase and understanding the symptoms. And if you hit that phase where you need protein for your body to rebuild and you're fasting at that point, it's very dangerous. Okay. You're going to be weak and disorientated and whatnot. And so that is what happened to me when I was doing the fast and that I finally resolved the kidney collecting tubule syndrome that I had. And the kidney collecting tubule syndrome is a complication that impacts almost every other healing program that there is. In my case, it impacted the brain tumor. The brain tumor, what is detected with the, with the CT scan is a mass. Okay, they can tell that there's something in the brain that's heavier than the other parts of the brain. What that mass is, is water. 
there's a water retention which is being caused by your kidney and that is causing you to not expel the water through your urine but keeping it there in your head this is what i came to after year i mean my son was was had just turned 1 years old when i had discovered german new medicine because we were having a birthday party for him in canada in vancouver we had a suite and we had a nice party and then it just happened to be that right before his birthday there was a two day course on german new medicine and i was at the time into western a price who was recommending a high fat diet and some sort of he has his theories nourishing traditions and on a message board somebody posted something there and made reference to german new medicine and i went and read about german new medicine and then i saw that there was a course in vancouver so i went in and i took the course and it completely changed my perspective on medicine it went against everything that i was taught as a child okay i mean everything everything that you're taught as a child and it was too much for me to handle it was a two day course i could only go the first day and then i was it was, it was just too much too much of a paradigm shift so i did not go to the second day i paid just for the one day but i learned enough that i knew i needed to get the scientific chart and i did and i started reading and understanding all these discoveries of dr homer and then i consulted with uh, Dr. Smukla, which who, who is a chiropractor in Hopkinton, Massachusetts, and got his perspective. When I took the course, the person told me, you'll be fine, right? You just have to re relax and your body will take care of itself. And, and that was his understanding. He was, uh, he was a good instructor. I appreciated the course. But when I talked to Dr. Smukla, Dr. Smukla was a chiropractor who then uh, started to practice German New Medicine. I think now he practices German New Medicine primarily. And what he told me is that the number one priority for you is to ensure you resolve any kidney collecting tubule syndrome that you have. And what he said, what causes these issues, it's called airy, which is Spanish for, for breath or word, A-I-R-E, abandonment, isolation, refugee, existence. Now, existence is when you don't know why you're there, why you exist, and you're suicidal. That's an extreme. And refugee is when you're in an unfamiliar territory and you don't have the support that you need. And I looked around at the time I'm talking to Smoothler on the phone, and what do I see? I see bags, luggage bags packed up because my wife and I and our son were planning to go visit India because she's originally from India and she, she has water retention as well. She worked in the airline industry. I met her in Paris. And I looked around and I knew I had a refugee syndrome. There was no question in my mind. The other, there's the R is refugee, and then there's isolation and abandonment. So isolation, if you're put in a, a place where you're isolated, right? Like you're in solitary confinement or in a prison, for example, that's isolation. And then abandonment is you feel like you've been abandoned. Children suffer this conflict a lot when they're just left at the daycare and no one's really um, there and they don't feel loved right, and whatnot. But for me, it was the refugee a conflict. And then Dr. Smukla told me, he said, what you need to do is you need to get yourself in a position where you establish roots and you're living in a home and you have furniture and you're comfortable and you feel that you have your own territory. That's what he was recommending. And I had just put in an offer for a house. My wife and I were looking for a house for two years, I believe. And this is, or maybe it was just one year. We had, we had moved to Seattle and we were looking for a house. I think we were looking for a year and we were looking for a year and a half. And then I put in one offer, it wasn't accepted. And then we, we came across a house that we wanted, but there was competition for it. And so there was a bidding process and we had to outbid eight or nine people. And so I bid more money than I had. And I told myself, well, once I get the, get the house, I just have to put the down payment on it and then negotiate a higher salary and it'll all work out. And so that's what I did. So that gets to the other aspect of, the, of these water conflicts 
which is, so there's two aspects to the kidney. There's a kidney collecting tubule syndrome, which is, has to do with water retention when you're having a refugee syndrome or you're in an unfamiliar environment. And then the second is the kidney itself, which has to do with a, a water conflict. And so the water conflict, as a human being, our water involves money. This is a reality. You need money to live in today's society. You need to have money to do things and survive. And then the language associated with finance has to do with that. They talk about drowning in debt, right? And your liquidity when you're talking about cash and cash flow and finances. Okay. So that's what was explained to me by Dr. Smukler, that if I want to heal the, the brain tumor, the number one priority is to get myself into a state where I'm stable and I have roots. And so I was doing that by buying the house. What I did when I bought the house though, is I took on a mortgage. And so, and then I had to furnish the house. It was a big house, it's, you know, over 4,000 square feet. And there's only three of us. So, so I put myself in that situation, but I hadn't resolved the water conflict because now I had a mortgage and I had to pay this mortgage every month. And if I didn't pay it, then I would lose the house because I didn't actually own the house. All I owned was nothing really. I just had a mortgage. And so, and that carried on the conflict. And I, was just looking at the finances and I, I didn't realize everyone would get some mortgage, right? So that's, you know, and I had the conversation with my wife too. I was like, look, this is crazy. Right? We're sitting here paying the mortgage. And she's like, yeah, but everyone does this. And I was like, no, not everyone does this. All the idiots do this. The place that I wanted to buy was a place that I could have bought with cash and then townhouse, we could have lived in it. And then after six months or a year, we could have moved out and rented that out as a, as a rental property. Yet I listened to her and what she wanted, which it worked out in the long run. But honestly, I go back to back to Adam and Eve and the biblical, um, you know, teachings on marriage. And husband is not supposed to be listening to the wife. Husband should follow God and do the right thing and have the wisdom and make the decision. And so I would have healed a lot earlier if I had taken the townhouse and we would have been comfortable. We would have been living in a place that we own. We'd be saving money and that would have become a rental and we would have had money to buy a second and third property. That's what would have happened if I had stuck to the Bible, although I wasn't reading the Bible that much at that time. I was reading the book of Proverbs only. I didn't really understand all the other aspects to it. So anyways, I made that, purchased that home, had a mortgage, water conflict carried on. I continued to study German New Medicine and tried to resolve all the conflicts. And that's the other thing Dr. Smukler said is that often this is a lifelong conflict that is resolving. And I believe in my case, it was a lifelong conflict. I believe that it was imprinted possibly when I was born. I was born with jaundice. It was a not a smooth delivery. It was a complicated delivery. And that was angry when I came out, I had jaundice. And then um, when I was four years old, I had a grandfather, who I would go and he came to visit us, stayed in my room, I'd go in to talk to him. And I found myself on the ground getting kicked in the, in the abdomen. And that's what he thought was necessary to, to raise a kid. And a lot of people have this mentality that kids should be beat, right? So I believe that that's probably where the where the conflict um, was imprinted. And then later on, there are other, other what is known as a fight or flight um, scenarios where you have to either, you have to either fight or you have to run away. Okay. And so I had, beyond that, I was jumped by many people. There was one tall guy, one sunny, and I think three, maybe three or four people who jumped me. Could have been more, I don't know. There's a circle around me. I just blocked and then my friend jumped in and, and I got out of that without hitting the ground, although I had a fat lip. So there was that aspect to it, which is similar to what happened with my grandfather and that it was a fight or flight in a position where I couldn't, it wasn't reasonable for me to defend myself because there were too many people 
Although if I had known martial arts like I know now, I probably would have taken them out. You had to get on the outside of them and take out the biggest one and move, work your way through the crowd. So today I could probably defend myself against that scenario. When it happened, my friend jumped in and rescued me. And so I, I got away in that scenario. There was an, a couple of other of these incidents. One At one point, I don't even know this person, right? The person knew me, but I didn't know him. And he came at me with a, a bottle and was trying to and he bottled me on the head, but I was wearing a toque, so I didn't take any damage. And then what I did is I realized, hey, I got to get out of here. And I got into the restaurant and then left out the back exit. And I left out the back exit. Uh, SUV pulls up with that guy and two other guys. They get out with crowbars. And then again, you know, it's like it's me versus three guys with crowbars. What am I going to do? Right? Fight or flight? I ran, right? I mean, my... Uh, my Taekwondo instructor, when I was younger, used to say, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day, right? And then sometimes you got to get out of there. So I got out of that situ situation and um, and then I, I ran to the, I think it was McDonald's and called the police and I got a ride home because I didn't feel like risking my life for work. I don't even know why they're angry at me. I think they were angry at me because I had nice car with rims that their cousin had and apparently because I had bought the same rims. I didn't even know this guy had the same rims that I was intruding on his style or something. It was like, it was one of the most ridiculous conflicts I've ever been in. So I believe that that's what caused the, caused the tumor is because it's in the motor cortex, which is associated with fight or flight, according to German New Medicine. It's also associated with self-devaluation, right? And what is self-devaluation? Well, that's when you don't think that you're good enough to do something, right? And I, I see it with people all the time. And I, what does it mean that you don't think you're good enough to do something? It means that you, for whichever reason you had a negative experience and you have called, taught yourself that you're not good at certain things, right? And, um, and so that could have been an aspect to it as well. So anyways, getting back to the water fast, right? Well, this is the healing journey, basically. I believe German New Medicine, it has worked for me so far. But the complication that when you have, when you have a tumor, what has happened is that you have healed, you have resolved the issue. So this fight or flight conflict, I had resolved it. I believe I resolved it by studying martial arts. And then when you get do martial arts and you get used to someone trying to hit you and you get out of the way and you hit them back and you learn all these self-defense and you realize that your body is pretty strong and has capability then that uh, that self-devaluation is gone and now what what should happen is that 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 water in the brain should leave the body through through the urinary tract and what that requires is that it requires the kidneys being healthy and it requires the bladder Okay, so that's the state that I was in. And I'm saying this now because I understand at the time, it was just, um, as I said, I came across German New Medicine and then Dr. Smukler explained this to me. That was the, basically the, the issue, is that my kidney was retaining water because I had was not financially confident. I had taken on debt. I didn't feel that I had enough money to provide for my family. And therefore, the tumor was not leaving the body. So now I've gotten myself into a situation where I have eliminated debt and I own multiple properties and I have figured out the tax law and I have a plan that's in place so I can provide for my wife and children and at the same time I can focus on doing things that will help other people and learning and growing. And healthcare in particular is something that I'm very keen on improving and I know that the, the conventional medicine does not work and it causes more harm than good. I know that there's a lot of dark forces around that and that they want to keep you enslaved because you are a recurring revenue stream for them. If you're on a pharmaceutical, then you're continuously creating profits for some companies. And if you're taking these expensive procedures and paying into insurance, you're making money for someone. So the incentive is not there when you're living in a capitalist society and a lot of people help the benefits of capitalism. And I'm not saying there's anything fundamentally wrong with capitalism. I think that it's a wonderful system and it's definitely better than communism. What I do think though, is that when it's applied to healthcare, 
that it changes the incentives drastically so that capitalism is should not be the foundation of healthcare. That there should be freedom when it comes to healthcare and what you need to do. So, came across German New Medicine and then resolved my financial situation so I have no debt and have come up with a strategy where I know that there's enough passive income for my children to do well and I know that I'll be able to take out money from my Roth IRA when they get older and they need cars and they need to go to college. So it's like that is all in my mind completely resolved now and that's why I've had these healing symptoms where the healing symptoms that I had when the kidney collecting tubule syndrome resolves, the symptom that you will have is that there will be a cloudy urine. And I've never had it before, but when I when I urinated, and there were clouds in my urine, it was a very cloudy urine. So that's one. Cloudy urine means that the kidney collecting tubule syndrome uh, has resolved. And then now you're in the repair phase. When you're in the repair phase, you need to have protein in your body. You need to be bringing in protein so that your body can repair. Okay? The other symptom that I had was a discharge which is when they talk about you have liquids, plasma, solids, and gases, right? And a liquid is different than a plasma. Blood is plasma and the liquid is, is like water, right? And so the discharge, the urinary discharge, and it would also, when it happened, there was a burning sensation when I was urinating and then a discharge. And that discharge was not semen, okay? It was not semen, although it had, um, it was, plasma like like semen it was not liquid it was solid and that was leaving my body as well and that was the resolution of the kidney itself from what I understand and what I recall okay so that happened and then I realized okay it clicked I said look okay this is what's happening I am now in a phase where I need to get substantial protein in the body and then, and this happened 14 days into the fast. But these symptoms happened, and then I felt very weak, and I felt that I needed to eat protein. So I broke the fast, and that was this year. I had uh, started it this year and did the 14 days. I broke the fast. I ate for for three three days, I believe, and I told myself, well, once the urine is no longer cloudy and there's no discharge, then that means I'll be out of that that uh, phase where I need protein and I can continue the fast. And so then I, when that happened, I said, okay, I'm going to start the fast again. And now I'm on day four, we'll be entering day five soon of the fast, the water fast. And I learned a lot through this experience. As I've said before, there are multiple ways of learning. One is theoretical knowledge. When I was taking the course on German New Medicine and it was a lot of information radically different than what I had learned and it was hard to believe but that's when I got theoretical knowledge. The stronger learning happens to experience so when you experience something firsthand I have experienced firsthand I know what a brain tumor feels like I know what it feels like to have that urinary discharge and cloudy urine I know the sensations in my in my pancreas and my liver I know the sensation of uh, other symptoms that I have. So that's first-hand knowledge. And that is much stronger than um, theoretical knowledge. And then the final phase is the teaching. If you understand something well enough that you can teach it to others and they understand it, then you're at another level of, of knowledge. And so someone who is there is Ilse Dora Laker. She's putting together courses on German New Medicine because she has I don't know exactly how long, maybe 25 years experience, maybe more, but she was in Dr. Hammer's inner circle, visits Germany to consult with Dr. Hammer. She's, she's a, a rare source of, of knowledge and has guided me. I took a course with her, I flew out to Toronto, I took her course, and um, and she's a wonderful lady. I mean, she's, she's doing a great job, and she's a teacher. So, and there were multiple times when things went, like I have the, what is called a tongue biting seizure, right? Where you, it's a, it, you have to experience it to understand it, right? It is, it is intense because there, I have had small seizures and then this, um, the, I think it's called, a, I, don't, I don't know what it's called. It's a tongue biting seizure and it's, it's intense. And so I consulted with her when that happened and found out 
what caused it and and got past that as well. So back to the water fast. The water fast, as I said, I look up in history. Who do I? Who's the who's the the greatest of all time? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the greatest of all time. The creator of the universe, God, who I love and I am 100% committed to. And I appreciate how he shapes me and molds me. And I know that this process that I'm going through is for the greater good. And it is for my ultimate growth and development and that I'm supported by him. So, number one, I also have a ton of respect for Moses. Okay, this guy was dealing with, if you read his story, right here. How he, uh, I mean, he has a staff and he splits the Red Sea. God splits it with, um, with wind, and then the the the, the, the interaction between him and Pharaoh. Let my people go, and Pharaoh will, will say, "Okay, I'll do it," and then he changes his mind. It happens several times. A lot of cool things with Moses, but. What I respect a lot about Moses is that he he was able to get those get his people out of Egypt and then take them um, to the promised land. I don't think he goes into he doesn't go into the promised land with them. He he passes away before that. But then in the wilderness to create structure and to get them to organize uh, themselves and to be able to to have that type of leadership that is that is remarkable. But as I said, Moses did the 41-day fast twice. And one time, the second time, he didn't eat or drink. Okay, so that's like another level. And then that is what increased his awareness, and that's why he was able to see God. He saw God, and he had this direct connection to God, right? So I definitely respect uh, Jesus and Moses, and then there there are others that I respect as well. But um, it was Jesus that got me on this side. On this fast because there's the story of, of uh, Jesus and Legion. Now Legion is a man that's afflicted by the reason they call him Legion is he's afflicted by a legion of demons. Multiple demons afflicted this man and he lived in the graveyards and he would he had immense strength and he was a, um, a, a, a character and a half. Okay, And then Jesus came and was able to cast the demons out of this man and the Disciples ask him, why weren't we able to cast the, the demons out of him? And Jesus responds and says, this is the type of demon that can only be cast out through prayer and fasting. And that's the scripture that I read um, at the end of last year. And I looked at that and I said, you know what? When I had first got the diagnosis and they said they found a brain lesion, immediately my mind went to, went to think of legion because they're pronounced similar, right? They go, you have a brain lesion. It's lesion with an S versus a G. But immediately I thought about that. I said, okay, this is probably caused by some sort of demonic influence. I was at the time involved in... It was before I was involved in interfaith ministry, but I was involved in perennial philosophy. And perennial philosophy is this idea that all religions have a common core and cultivate character strengths and wisdoms and that you can learn from other religions. And so there was a book that I had on perennial philosophy that included practices from Hinduism and Islam and Buddhism. And I believe the author may have been Christian. I don't know. But so it's like this kind of multiple paths and they're all taking you down the same. And that that was what I was into. And through that, I was involved in meditation and martial arts as well as I had gone to a Buddhist monastery and did meditation and that's actually where that's actually where the seizure started is through the practice known as Zazen where you have to sit cross-legged and when I got up from that experience my leg fell asleep and so I tried to wake it up by banging it and then I had the first seizure which was not the first seizure the first seizure was when I was jumping into the swimming pool so it was the second seizure anyways 
Yes, it was a second TJ. So, so that's where the state that I was in. I, I was, I believe that there are multiple paths towards um, developing spirituality, and I was open to them all. And later, I would become an interfaith minister. In terms of because I was raised, I was raised as a Christian from the age of five, I believe. I went to church and read the Bible, learned the Bible. Yet I never really had a strong connection to my, the religion of my grandparents, which is Sikhism. And so I always had this desire to learn more about it. And, uh, and then, and the Sikh scriptures, uh, I think his name was, there, there was 10 girls, the last is a book, there was nine girls. And the girl would go on these, we would go on these um, pilgrimages with a, with a string instrument player who was a Muslim and he would sing songs and in his songs he would mention the names of the Hindu pantheon. And so I felt that I should know more about Hinduism and all of these entities. And so I, that became, um, my curiosity led me to that. And I learned about these mythologies and these false gods. And I won't say their name, but there are a lot of them. One looks like an elephant and the other carries a trident. And then there's a goddess that's associated in all these stories, right? So... So I was involved in that. There was also a mantra that I was given, which I was using to meditate. And I, at first I didn't want to use it because I was thinking, I don't know what this is going to do. But then I eventually used it, started using it. And when you use these types of mantras or you make connections with these idols, then you're basically giving demons the right to come and attack you. Basically, it's when you break the Ten Commandments, and one of the commandments is, "Thou shalt not have, thou shalt not commit idolatry, and thou shalt not have any gods before me." Those commandments are there; they came from Jehovah, given to Moses, and I was breaking them. And when you break them, now the demons have contractual right to attack you in the spiritual world. Once you've broken those commandments and those commandments are there to protect you, to help you to, to be strong and to, and to realize God's will for your life. Once you've broken them, the demons can attack you. Okay. And, and that is what happened to me. I am pretty certain of this, that what I experienced was demonic in nature. Something was controlling my body and it wasn't me and that they had a right to do so because I had wandered into so many strange practices with mantras and with interfaith ministry, perennial philosophy, and thinking that all of these entities were all beneficial, okay? That was all completely wrong. And the reality is, is that there's one creator that created the universe, and that creator sent his only son to die on the cross for my sins because he wanted to establish a new covenant. I've come to that conclusion and through the name of Jesus Christ, you can exercise demons. And if you align to Christ's commandments, then the demons have no right to come anywhere near you. And it talks about this too, right? Jesus talks about this, that what happens when the demon is cast out, they leave for a while and then they wander and they wander and they can't find anywhere else to go. So what they'll do is they'll come back to the original body and they will find the body swept and clean. They will come back with seven of their friends. And so what was one demon now becomes eight. And I experienced that as well. After that first fast, I felt that I was healed. Okay, I had, I felt, couldn't feel anything. I felt 100% healed. And then I was, I was, I was enthusiastic and I, and I broke the fast. And at that point, 
I didn't break the fast because of hunger. I broke the fast because I was reading these things online where people say, no, you can't do that type of fast. You need electrolytes and it's dangerous and all sorts of stuff. And so I broke the fast. And at the same time, I was thinking, you know, why am I coming to this church and doing these things, right? It's all Satan basically trying to keep me from getting deeper into Christianity. And so I went through this period where I wasn't able to leave the house and I had broken the fast, not because it was time to break it, but because I had inadequate advice. And so then I got this book. I said, look, you know, I'm watching these videos and people are talking about electrolytes, you need to do this, you need to do that. And then I was like, look, these people don't know what they're talking about. They're just making it up. People are afraid of fasting. I found a book that was written 100 years ago by a doctor who specialized in fast and he had intensive case studies, healed many people of many diseases. And then I said, you know what? These are all ignorant people. They, they don't know what they're talking about. This doctor is the one that had the experience and he has data and what he's writing is what I believe is true. I'm going to follow his advice. And so I did. It's a combination though. I had the German New Medicine in terms of when do I need protein. Then I had the, this guidance from a doctor, Shelton. And I'll post a link to that as well. When I had that prepared, ready to go, now I'm at another level. I said, okay, I can do this now. And so I tried again. Now, the first time I did it, I went 10 days. And then the second time I went 14 days. And then at 14 days, I realized that, hey, I have all the symptoms of, I've healed my kidney collecting tubule syndrome. I've healed something in my kidney. I'm, I, my urine is cloudy. I have a discharge. And my body feels weak. I feel like I need to eat protein. And I'm not going to risk killing myself. I'm not looking for complicated eating. So what did I do? I ate protein for a few days. What did I eat for protein? I ate sea bass, sardines, cheese, and I also ate papaya. And the reason I ate papaya is because I had flatulence. And when you have flatulence, it's because your, your, your pancreas is not producing the enzyme that's necessary to digest the food. And so I ate the papaya as well. I ate those things. And I ate them for, I think, three days. And then I was watching my urine, and the urine was cloudy, cloudy, and then had the burning, and then eventually the burning sensation went away, the cloudiness went away, the urine is coming out clear. Okay, I'm good to go. Started the fast again. So I'm entering the fifth day. And the goal is to go minimum 41 days, two goals, one accomplished. I felt thirst for the first time. I've yet to feel hunger. 39 years old, never felt hunger, never felt hunger. And I'm going based on the guidance from this doctor who specialized in fasting. And what it says is that when you experience hunger, you will know that you are hungry. And then right now in the phase that I'm in, it's not hunger because what's happening at this point is that I have stop digesting food so that frees up the body's energy to do needed maintenance to go and find these cells that contain toxins and things that i haven't been able to digest and digest them and things that i haven't digest i mean i'm having the sensation you can feel it inside your body when your mind is closed i have sensation of of uh, the taste of liquor that I only had a long time ago, right? And so it's still in the body. And as I'm going through the fast, that will leave. And then once that's gone, then my body will start to repair itself. And that doesn't happen until day 16. So I'm entering day five. Day 16 is when the body will repair itself. The longest I went was day 14. So once I get into day 16, once you get into day 16, is when the body will repair. And until day 16, it's the body is just cleaning, cleansing, cleansing, cleansing. And so the first time I did the fast, I had the nasal discharge, tons of mucus coming out of the nose, and I felt the sensations in the lungs. And then the second time I did the fast, 
I did not have the nasal discharge or the sensations in the lung. I had the feeling that my body was metabolizing calcium or milk. I felt like my body was drinking milk, even though I had not eaten anything for for 12 days. It felt like I had a lot of milk and the body was eating the milk. I felt very nourished. And now I haven't had any of those sensations yet, yet I have no hunger. So that's where I am. Decided I'd put together one video that uh, explains it all. And then I will, I have data that I can post as well in terms of I track my body weight and afterwards I started to track my fluid intake and output and then just put some notes about what was going through um, so it's there and as I said I'm entering day five and I'll post another update whenever anything happens I feel that this is going to this is going to be a, a good stretch and I'll be able to go 41 days and if I don't go 41 days well then I will do what I need to do to ensure I survive and continue to heal, and I'll try again. A quitter never wins, and a winner never quits. Persistence is an important part of life. You want to accomplish something, you need to be persistent. This is something that I heard, and uh, there was a movie called The Founder. Michael Keaton is the founder, not the founder of McDonald's, but the one who takes it to the next level. Okay, so the two brothers invent McDonald's. He sees it, he recognizes it as an amazing opportunity, and then he basically ends up taking it nationwide, takes it to be what it is today, a huge company. And at the end of the movie, he says exactly that. He said, I didn't have the idea, I didn't have the knowledge, I didn't have anything. The only thing I had was persistence. I knew it needed to be taken nationwide and I was going to do it and I was going to do it at any and all cost. Now I'm paraphrasing, you might have not said exactly that, but that, that was a good movie. And when I watched that and saw that, because you go out now, you see McDonald's everywhere, those arches, right? And then he he was a, he had um, assistance from a finance guy who told him basically, the way that you take this to the next level is you own the, the realty and you start the franchise corporation and that will allow you to have the consistent experience which the original partners wanted and then he bought them out he paid them i think they got like it was a you know they he paid them 2.7 million so after taxes they got 2 million each and then um handshake agreement for one percent going forward and that never materialized because it wasn't written down and who knows if there was even a handshake but persistence okay so my goal for this year is to heal and to grow as a Christian and a father and as a human being. And the way that I'm going to do it is by fasting for at least 41 days. And I will not take any risks when I fast. I will not compromise my health. I will not starve. I will not go into a complication. But I have a lot of time ahead of me. It's only only mid-February so I have months ahead of me I hope that it's done this time around so then I can move on to the next goal and that's it just wanted to put this out there in terms of um, I put out short videos day-to-day -day updates and uh, I might delete those I don't know but I'll put this out because this is a more of a summary of my experiences so far and tie the story together so that it's easier to understand for anyone that is looking to heal themselves, I would recommend German New Medicine. You can't get this one, it's, it's hard to get, but I'll give you, I'll post a link so when it is available, buy it, that's the best choice. I'll also post links to freely available resources which are not as good, not written by Dr. Hammer himself, but they are still very good. And there's two of them, there's a PDF and then there's a website. Study German New Medicine. And then I'll post also the book to the doctor who specialized in fasting. You can. Read what he wrote about fasting in the different phases. And I'll post a, a summary of the phases as well. Okay, so I'm going to post those five things along with this video. God bless you. I believe that fasting is good for your health and that it will heal you. I believe that it will heal me and that I'll be able to provide more 
wisdom and guidance on the topic, having gone through the process myself. And we're going to end the video. Have a good Sunday. Keep your faith, faith the size of a mustard seed can move a mountain. You have uh, the ability to heal. There is a God that loves you, that wants you to heal. There is a path forward for you to be healthy and to be strong and to accomplish your goals, to realize anything and everything you want, whether that's passive income and a lifestyle where you can travel around freely with your children and, and raise them with God's commandments inscribed in their heart, or whether that's healing that you need from the Lord, where the healing comes from Jesus Christ. And if you need to do a fast for that, then prepare yourself for it. Do your research, read the resources I have, and, and do it. At the end of the day, you are responsible for your health and your family and everything else in this life. No one else. And no one else is going to care about it as much as you do.